In the last module, we noted a uh, particular rule that applied to phases in the phase diagrams of one component systems. And just to remind you, it basically said that the dimensionality of a feature on those uh, phase diagrams would be given by f equals 3 minus the number of phases. So f indicates the dimensionality of the, uh, of the particular object on the diagram. Now a question we might ask is, in the case of solutions, uh, how would, would this translate to a multi-component system? So if we have a multi-component system, we have, uh, again, several variables or several quantities that we've got to account for. All right, first of all, I'll just say that C will equal the number of components. So most of the time we've been dealing with two component systems, so in that case C would be equal to two. P will equal the number of phases that each of those components could have. Now, we've been talking mostly about solid, liquid, and gas as the three phases, but you should be aware that um, there are also substances that have more than one solid phase. For example, water has seven or eight different solid phases, and each of them counts as an independent phase in a phase diagram, so we would need to take account of them. So this could be a number that's greater than three. Um, finally, F will be our general placeholder for the dimensionality of whatever feature we're talking about. And, um, and that feature can contain any uh, group of phases and components as part of it. So when we, have a more than, when we have more than one component, we could actually have a phase that includes both components. Or we could have a phase that includes both components and two different phases, like uh, liquid and vapor in equilibrium with one another. Now, one of the things that we uh, will want to uh, first reckon is what is the total dimensionality possible? What is the maximum possible dimensionality we could have in a system that has this many components, C components, and P phases. Well, if each component can, uh, can assume any of the P phases, that would give us a total of P times C different variables that we would need to describe the system. In addition, we're also going to be interested in talking about temperature and pressure. And remember, the phase diagrams we saw for one component, component systems were graphs of pen, uh, pressure versus temperature. So that will add two to this. So in a sense, our maximum number of degrees of freedom, or maximum number of dimensionality, is going to be P times C plus 2. Okay, now as an example of that, if I had a two component system, so let's say I had two components, A and B, and each of them could exist in solid, liquid, or gas phases, I would have A as a solid, A as a liquid, A as a gas. Those would be three of the variables I would need. I would have B as a solid, B as a liquid, and B as a gas. That would be three more. And then I would have temperature and pressure. So I would have a total of eight, which would be, if I use that to calculate it, that would be the result that I would get. All right, but we know that that's way more than we actually need to specify a phase. For example, we're going to have mathematical constraints that will reduce this. Just to give you an example of this, for example, uh, we have mole fractions. If I have a two-component system, the mole fractions have to add up to one. So in effect, if I know one of those mole fractions, I know them both. Because if I know x1, I know x2 because I can just calculate it from this. So that represents a constraint on the system, and that constraint, in effect, reduces the number of variables that I will need to describe the system. So how many constraints would we have for a phase diagram system like this? Well, each phase will have a set of mole fractions, just like I've drawn here. Since I don't know how many components there are, I'll do a summation over the components. And all of those components, the mole fractions, must add up to 1. So I'm going to have one of these statements for each of the phases that I may have in the system. Since I have a total of P phases, I'm going to have a total of P constraints. I'm also going to have constraints because I know at the border between those phases, I've got to have a system that is going to be in equilibrium where the chemical potentials across that equilibrium line are going to be equal. So for example, for component J, I might have that the uh, phase 1 chemical potential is equal to the phase 2 chemical potential. And then I might also have that the phase 2 chemical potential is going to be equal to the phase 3 chemical potential at their borderline. 
So these represent different border lines between phases. And I will have a total of up to m of p minus 1 for component j is equal to the chemical potential for the p phase of component j. If I add each of these equations as a new constraint, I'll have a total of p minus 1 of these equations. That's how many I would have written here. But I have one for each component. So in fact, the total number of constraints that I'll get out of this will be c times this number as the total number of constraints. All right, so that actually constitutes all of the constraints that uh, we normally would have to account for in the case of our uh, phase diagram with multiple components. So let's add up what the total is going to be. So the total dimensionality, or total number of variables that are independent, total independent variables in this case, will be given by a number, and I'll, I'll write that the number of independent variables, the degrees of freedom, would be the total number that we could possibly have, which was this from our from our observation up here. And then we've got to subtract the constraints. So I have to subtract these constraints. I have to subtract p. And I have to subtract these constraints, minus c times p minus 1. So I'll have pc plus 2 minus p minus pc plus c. So obviously the PC products will disappear. And in the end, I'll end up with the number of degrees of freedom is going to be the number of components plus 2 minus the number of phases. All right, now if we've done this right, this should give us for a one component system the same result that we had before. And indeed, for a one component system, I would get the number of degrees of freedom is just 3 minus P. So this does look like it checks out. Now I want to mention two other uh, uh, aspects that come into this. One is that uh, for chemical reaction systems, we often will have an equilibrium that will link the number of the mole fraction of two or more components. And in fact, since each of those equilibriums constitutes another constraint, we'll have this reduced even further. So I'll just write reduce further if there is chemical equilibrium. If it's just one equilibrium, if it's just one reaction, that's just one constraint that gets added on to this. All right, but if there's more than one equilibrium going on in some mixture that we have, then we'll have to include a constraint for each one of those. 